So, good afternoon, ministers, um, and thank you very much for appearing to give evidence today, <coughs> Mr. Tom Perslove and also Minister Guy Opperman. Uh, we are fortunate that the Chairman of the Select Committee of Transport, uh, Mr. Ian Stewart, uh, has agreed to join us and will be asking some questions as well, given the importance of the issue to both our respective cities. Um, it's unusual for us to have two ministers give evidence together on the same issue, but it speaks to the seriousness of the EU's soon-to-be-introduced entry-exit system and the potential disruption it will cause at the UK border. Ministers, I have to be frank, our inquiry has heard evidence from 11 organisations and has received upwards of 20 submissions of written evidence, which taken together paints a worrying picture of how the system will impact travellers and the movement of goods from the UK out to the EU Schengen area. More worrying still is another theme emerging from our inquiry, the slow and apparently inadequate preparations being undertaken by the government. I very much hope that this afternoon you will prove that this is not the case. I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Ministers, the, check is, the clock is ticking. Entry exit <clears throat> is expected to go live by the end of this year and its ramifications will be felt far and wide and by many UK and other citizens. From those going away to France from Dover for the weekend to the EU haulier tasked with crossing into the UK to bring fresh fruit and vegetables. Today we will cover, amongst other issues, your preparations for EES, the financial implications of the system for operators, the impact of the system on traffic in and around Kent, what it will mean for travellers, your engagement with the EU and France on its introduction, and the functioning of the UK post-Brexit border. For those watching at home, would you respectively mind introducing yourselves. We'll start with you, Minister Perslove, and then Minister Opperman, and then your officials, Dan Hobbs and Ian Forbes. So first of all, Minister Perslove, if you could describe your functions. Yes, so I'm, I'm Tom Perslove MP. I'm the Minister of State for Legal Migration and the Border at the Home Office. And in terms of the government position, it's my department that has ownership of the policy in relation to EES and ETIAS from a UK government perspective. Good. Thank you. Guy Opperman. Uh, Guy Opperman, Minister for Transport, uh, was asked by Minister Perseglove, who I call a close personal friend, to come along and assist today and was delighted to do so. Um, I uh, represent the DFT in respect of uh, matters of the uh, Port of Dover in particular, uh, and uh, I have uh, the Commons responsibility for ports, albeit that is the Lords Minister who takes direct responsibility. I'm not in charge of airports, but as always with all government ministers, I will attempt to answer <coughs> everything possible today. Good. Well, here we are, and I'm going to ask the first question. <clears throat> uh, there is a great deal of uncertainty regarding the final form of the EU entry-exit system and when it will be introduced. How do you expect... Minister First Love first. How do you expect travel operators in the UK to plan and prepare for the launch of EES when they don't know what's going, what it's going to look like or when it's going to start? And I'm going to give you three examples. The EU regulation governing the entry exit system was adopted in 2017, but seven years later, and we've heard that operators in the UK are still waiting to learn how it's going to work. So what have the EU and France been doing for the last seven years? Secondly, why has the implementation of the system been delayed so many times? And lastly, are we looking at an abdication of the EU and France's responsibilities to the UK as a key partner and European travel and trade? So those are the three questions. So over to you if you'd be kind enough to answer those questions, first of all. Minister Perslove, thank you. Yes, yeah, so thank you, um, Mr Chairman. And I think one of the sort of first points that I would really want to make is that when it comes to these EU initiatives, 
there is an awful lot of alignment to domestic work that we are taking forward in order to deliver greater border security, but also enhance automation at the border to try and improve the passenger experience. And that's reflected particularly through the work that we are doing through the ETA programme that, that I've got no doubt you'll want to touch on, not least because there is a lot of domestic change to the way in which we um, are going to be dealing with travel and advanced notification to allow us to have a better picture um, around risk and, and threats, but also allowing Border Force staff to, to focus more of their energy and resource on higher risk work and to um, improve that passenger experience, as I say. But, but we, broadly speaking, share the objective that the EU is seeking to take forward. We are very much working on a basis whereby this policy will go live on the 6th of October. Um, it is important that we plan to that eventuality. We are expecting to hear definitively from the European Union that go live arrangement in the summer. Um, but that is not a um, significant length of time, as you acknowledge. In your opening remarks, you, you sort of raised concerns around the level of preparedness from the UK government. I think that um, some of the evidence that you've taken um, speaks for itself, but much of it also will be superseded by progress that has been made in recent weeks, which no doubt Minister Opperman will want to set out as well. But we have to work on the basis that this will go live in October. There are opportunities around precautionary measures. We are still trying to understand what that looks like, but that would be, for example, where there were um, delays to a certain length of time, which would then allow practical application of the policy. Of course, the international engagement piece of this is progressing as well at all levels of government. We're focusing really on two areas. One of them is um, that go live date, trying to ascertain as much clarity as we can as to whether that 6th of October date is definitively going to be the date, but we have to work on the basis that it is. But also what could reasonably be done to make sure that there is a practical and pragmatic implementation of this policy against the backdrop that this is the EU scheme, this is not the UK government scheme, we do not have ownership of this, this is something that they want to do, but as I say, we are supportive of the broad principles that they are trying to take forward through the implementation of this, which should lead to enhanced border security, which is beneficial not just for the EU and its member states, but also for the UK. Um, can, I, can I just come in and, and assist um, Mr Chairman, if I could? I mean, I think, uh, as Tom rightly has identified, this has been delayed on a repeat basis by the Commission, and that is something that we've just had to deal with. Clearly, we work on the 6th of October as a start date, but clearly there are still a number of, to use the expression, known unknowns, that we await from the Commission on an ongoing basis. We will talk later on, I'm quite sure, about uh, the availability of an app, for example. Now, that is not going to be available at the present stage until August at best. So uh, that is not something that is in the control of this government. That, that's my first point. My second point would be, I've read the transcripts of the evidence of the sessions you've had previously, culminating on the 31st of January, when you had a number of the Kent um, officials and the leader of the County Council, Roger Goff, and others uh, present in this particular uh, forum. I'd like to think, um, I'd love to take the credit, it was just Tom and I, but there has been a wider cross-government approach, which I can talk some things about, I can't talk in total detail, but if I tell you that there has been a multi-government uh, series of meetings on six separate occasions, uh, which are called government sprints, they're akin to a COBRA, uh, that are held with Home Office, uh, DFT, Cabinet Office in, the, in uh, uh, chairing it, uh, but also having all other ministers and other uh, organisations present. I've done 14 years of government, I've done nine years as a minister, I've never known such concerted work in this year. That commenced uh, basically in January of this year and has worked all the way through the spring. So uh, I accept entirely any criticism that could be made from yesteryear that we haven't all collectively as government come together and done all the things we could. Legitimate point, you, you're hard pressed to do so when you don't know the details of what you're facing. But I genuinely want to assure the committee that since the beginning of this year, we have absolutely been all over this. I, I, I don't know about Tom, but I would certainly say this, I spent more time on this particular project than anything else I've done in the six months I've been as Minister for Transport. Um, the FCDO are utterly involved in this. 
and when Leo Doherty was the Minister uh, for Europe effectively and the various colleagues that exist, whether in the Paris Embassy or elsewhere, are fully involved and working very cooperatively as we are cooperatively working with our European partners. So I genuinely feel that we can set out a huge amount of work that's been done. One final point, you legitimately raised uh, individual ferry operators and the like and their concerns, some of whom you heard in evidence, uh, two of whom uh, I met with yesterday. So every month now I meet with, uh, as in collection with uh, officials from the Home Office and DFT officials, I meet with all the ferry operators at Port of Dover, um, the Confederation of Passenger Transport, the UK Coach Operators Association, the Road Haulage Association, Logistics UK, uh, I could go on. Uh, there is a monthly meeting on an ongoing basis to ensure that we are all aligned. It is a safe space for everyone to go, I don't quite understand this or please explain this, and we are working collectively together. Does that mean to say that there isn't stuff that has to be done between now and October the 6th and beyond? Of course, that's, of course that's not right to say. But there is a lot of work going on. That's a, Stop there, because I don't want to... I'm glad to hear that. I only say this, that the degree of bottleneck um, which is anticipated, the sheer frustration which came out of some of the evidence uh, from some of the witnesses which you've read... Yep. Um, is not a matter of invention or even speculation. It is there in black and white in the transcripts we've read. And of course, it's not just about however important it may be for Kent itself, and we regard that as very important indeed, but also the impact on tourism, the fact that people are coming to this country, the fact that... Um, there are people all over the United Kingdom who travel down there in coaches and in cars and so forth. So actually there is going to be a real test when it comes into operation. And that test I would simply describe as frustration if it doesn't work on a scale that will be really very serious. And no doubt in relation to that, we will come on to the kind of communication strategy and, and the work that is ongoing not just as government, but also with operators, and again, working um, with our EU counterparts to make sure that we get that right. But a few weeks ago, I visited Eurostar at St Pancras. The infrastructure is going in. The level of planning um, has been very impressive in terms of the thinking that's going on around passenger flows and making sure that people understand what they need to do, recognising that actually this will be a bit of a change for people, that there will be this extra process that they need to go through. And I, again, I think, and I would pay tribute to colleagues in DFT, but also to my own team in the Home Office, we have been making some real progress around the planning. When you consider the change in posture that we've managed to secure when it comes to the way in which coaches will be dealt with and the contingency planning that has been put in place around that, I think it shows that we have been on the ball, we have been raising these issues, we have been coming up with pragmatic solutions, and that through engagement involving both the industry and the various operators, but also um, the French authorities and the Commission, we've been able to get practical solutions and we're continuing to look at what more we can do in relation to cars, for example. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would endorse that. I would not want this committee in any way to want to criticise the EU Commission or the French uh, organisations, not least because you look at what is, we've managed to secure by way of pragmatic talking uh, and very positive engagement on a, on a multilateral basis uh, that, as you know, Tom rightly outlined, uh, the position in relation to the handling of coaches uh, in the Western docks is totally transformed. And I look at the evidence that you were given by Port of Dover, for example, many, many months ago, and I look at the present situation and the degree of millions of pounds of investment that is going on, both in the short term, medium term, and the very longer term, I look at the Luff bid of 35 million, I think it is, think uh, 45 million, I'm so sorry, uh, that, will, uh, that has been granted, which will then go for the uh, outbound control investment. That we are working very much on a cross-border basis, and it is in everybody's interests, not just the UK's interests, that this works well. Yes, and believe me, I'm sure that as a result of what's heard in this session, those people who gave <coughs> evidence over the last year uh, who have given evidence which has been rather negative to the great extent will no doubt come forward 
and come forward with their own views as to what they hear in this session. So the proof of the pudding, if I may say, will not only be as a result of what is of course. looked at in this meeting, but also, of course, when the whole system begins to roll out. And as that happens, then if there is bottleneck and frustration, etc., then everyone will know that at least the right questions were asked and hopefully the right answers will be given and I'm encouraged to some extent against the background of the evidence that we've already received at your fairly confident assertion that things have greatly speeded up and improved and therefore the proof of the pudding ought to be better than what we we're anticipating. Agreed. And we would both accept, I think, that there is still distance to travel. There are still elements of this where we need to agree solutions. But I would most definitely commend the various operators for the grip and determination that they have shown in working with us to argue the case to get sensible, pragmatic arrangements and infrastructure put in place. And it's in their UK commercial government. interests as well as in the interests of the UK. It's in everybody. Mr interest. Chairman, if it, if it helps you, I'm six of the witnesses who have given evidence to you I met yesterday. Yeah. Uh, you know, the three ferry operators, the coach operators, the RHA, all the various um, transitory organisations, um, they are very, very committed to making this work. Good. They are, I mean, I don't want to put words into their mouth, but they see tremendous steps forward, and I echo Tom's point, we've still got some way to go, though. OK, so next question, please, Andrew Jenkins. Thank you, Chairman. Um, to Minister Pearsglove, there are currently no plans for the UK ports to be able to trial the EES before the launch day. Why have you not made any arrangements for the, a UK trial period for EES with the European Commission and France? I am anticipating that there will be opportunities oh, for the good. technology to be trialled and tested um, over the course of the coming weeks. Oh, that's very good. If I can help as well, is that, that clearly the the things like the app will make a tremendous difference because you could do pre-registration and all the things that go with an app. Um, it, you don't need to be a, um, a skeptic about uh, computer projects to think that provision of the app in August for going live in October is optimistic. Um, but clearly, the sooner we have the app and the digital capability to test it, the sooner everybody, and this applies across the EU, will be very, very keen to do that exactly that. You said a matter of weeks. Have you, have you got a time scale? Um, we had actually anticipated it happening um, within the course of recent days. Okay. That hasn't happened, but I am anticipating that some of that testing will move forward. And, for example, one of the things that I was shown when I visited St Pancras a few weeks ago was the technology that has been installed on some of the concourses in some of the side rooms where people can go in and mm -hmm. on that data into the system. So actually you are beginning to see that physical infrastructure appearing and understandably they want to get on and test that and make sure that it all works as anticipated. It, the earlier we can do that the better it is of course. Th there's also, for example, there's the kiosks that are being purchased, mm -hmm. some of which are available, like five are available for testing. Um, but clearly, it's a chicken and egg situation. But the, the, trust me, the ports, particularly Port of Dover, are extremely keen, and all the juxtaposed ports are very, very keen uh, to test this as soon as they possibly can. Thank you. Um, you mentioned, um, actually, um, Minister Opperman, about um, the delay till October, um, which was agreed. Clearly, there is political will, there is a way. Have you asked the European Commission or France for a delay? to give UK ports and carriers a chance to trial the new system? So if I, I'll answer that first and let Tom come in with any particular points. I mean, it, it, if I can explain the situation, this, this is something that's brought in many, many years ago, and it was originally coming in in 2022 and then 2023. <coughs> um, so it has been delayed twice already. Um, clearly, it is the intention of the Commission at the present stage to proceed with this. There is a lot of work being done by FCDO uh, ambassadors and representatives to try and get a detailed amount of information about how ready our European partners are. We have worked on the basis, and we have really tried to press this, that the UK should be as ready as anybody, frankly, and that it is in our interest to be at the front of the queue, if you want a better expression. And that is what we intend to do, and we are 
certainly working cross-government to do that. Um, it, it is an EU Commission decision, but there's no doubt that everybody from the PM to the Foreign Secretary to the Home Secretary to the, my, my boss, Secretary of State for Transport, have met with all of our opposite numbers and have discussed these matters on an ongoing basis repeatedly. Thank you. Um, and again, just to, just to add to that, um, in terms of commencement, the position has been communicated realistically that you know, we need to work on the basis of that beginning this on the 6th of October, as I say. I think the EU would probably argue that the sort of flexibility and pragmatism comes in around those precautionary measures and where, for example, there is um, a risk of excessive delays within that first six months and the publicly stated position is that there will be precautionary measures available to invoke in those situations. The, the moment, the position is that we do not have the detail as to what those precautionary measures look like. Um, but I think to go to very directly to the heart of your question, they would see that as being pragmatic commencement of the policy. We must plan for the 6th of October start date but these are all conversations that we continue to have in the way that Guy has described at all levels of government. I've met with various um, EU member state ambassadors where this issue has come up, as well as um, various ministers from, from foreign governments as well, and we will continue to sustain that engagement. We would, of course, much rather have a situation where, for example, the app was available, because the more of this that can be done upstream, the better it is, but we have to deal with the situation as it is, perhaps not as we would like it to be in every respect. Can I have one key point, which is uh, I think it's really important the committee understands the nature of the precautionary flexibility measures, because that's a, a fancy title for what I call a soft launch, mm. right? So if you were launching a business or a hotel or whatever, you'd have a soft launch before you go a full go live situation. It is agreed pretty much that there will be a six month uh, period of time and that nicely coincides with the winter period. So from 6th of October through to up to and including Easter. Um, most organizations would say that Easter half term summer holidays are the particular key problematic areas for all of our uh, travel destinations for obvious reasons, right? So we have a six month period at the very least and that potentially could be extended, we don't know, but we certainly have a six month period where the implementation of this is effectively by way of a soft launch. Now that doesn't mean to say that this isn't going to come in, I think it will come in, but it will be then treated and what that means in reality is that if one got to a situation where there were a certain amount of queues or delays, then the, pro the provisions of the precautionary flexibility measures allow for much greater freedom of passage of uh, vehicles, coaches, HGV cars. That takes care of so much of the queuing, so many of the complications. Now, the devil is always in the detail, and we don't know the final details, um, but the pr principle of you have a six-month period, and I go back to the Chair's original comments about we were very concerned about uh, the evidence we've been given. Clearly, when everybody gave evidence of that, they didn't know that we were going to be able to secure from the Commission a effectively six months off launch. Mm. That is a massive step forward. It's a massive step forward by the Commission, and it is very welcomed, obviously, by the UK, but also by other governments around the, uh, the, the European Union. Can I just have one follow-up question on that? Since any disruption is going to be experienced on the UK side in towns around the coast or roads, etc., who has the final say as to whether or not the precautionary measures are introduced? Can we introduce them unilaterally and we say, look, this is causing problems, or do we have to have the permission of the French? I would say, and again, just back into the point that I made earlier, that we are awaiting the final detail of those precautionary measures and what they look like, but bearing in mind that we are trying to be supportive of this and the delivery and the successful rollout of this, not least because it mirrors a lot of the work that we are trying to take forward to improve our own border security and automation opportunities, that there would be practical, pragmatic, sensible conversations that would be had. But it's very difficult to give a definitive answer to your question without having all of the kind of parameters that we would be working within to hand. Um, but I would hope and expect that that would be something that we would look at in a collaborative way as we are in terms of trying to identify solutions to the practical challenges on the ground that 
our constituents and people across the country would understandably be worried about when it comes to delays and the risks of delays. Okay, if I can help, um, uh, Mr. Wilson, is that this is a proposal from the EU. So it is they have proposed um, the precautionary flexible measures to help improve flow during busy periods. It's individual member states are then considering how to deploy these and how they then mitigate uh, the problems during the six months. It, the practical reality, if I can uh, be totally honest with you, is there have been times in the past um, where some ports, some airports, have faced these problems already, with or without these particular things that we're introducing. So uh, the local organisations like Kent County Council or other local authorities, other organisations, have had to deal with these issues in the past and are prepared in broad principles. Clearly, this is a different set of circumstances. The broad principle of deployment of measures to assist your local community to um, continue to function, your tourist trade to continue to function, how you manage traffic flows, are already things that are in operation and are all, that people are aware of. And by the nature of it as well, obviously there will be individual port operators um, that will be based in the UK that this is materially relevant to and the operating staff and, and the teams there will obviously play into the dynamic as well and the conversations that will need to be had about when the circumstances are appropriate simply based on the operational realities that they're dealing with um, around it. I think there's a question. Andrew. Yeah, just, um, I mean, you've, you've covered some of it. Um, you told us in correspondence that the EU will be able to pause the requirements for biometric information to be recorded through the ES in the first six months of its operation. If delays are likely, is this enough and can we intervene? Again, I think we need to receive the sort of definitive precautionary measures proposals from the Commission and the Member States and then how they intend to develop the guidance around operationalising those. But again, there is flexibility. That is the, that is the whole purpose of why they've committed to the principle of precautionary measures. Again, it is not in anybody's interest for this not to work. Um, it is not in our interest, it's not in the European Union's interest, it is not in any of the individual operators' interest for this not to work. And I would reasonably expect, and I think the committee should reasonably expect, that there will be a practical and pragmatic application of this when it comes to go live. Um, if I can address the point, and we put this to Port of Dover, who I meet with, I met Doug Bannister, the chief executive yesterday, and met the ferry operators yesterday, met the various organisations who are taking people through it yesterday. Um, if I can put it, they take the view that with the dispensation in play, in other words, with the um, measures we've been talking about, their capacity of um, dealing with 420 cars and 21 coaches per hour would be sufficient. Now. Clearly, you can't be certain of all matters, and uh, this is a reasonably constrained piece of geography, but they reckon that with the dispensations that are proposed, they can accommodate this on an ongoing basis. Thank you. Just one question before moving on to Mr. Smith. Um, these precautionary principles, are they underpinned by some legal requirement? Is there some contractual basis or statutory basis? Um, is there an agreement which is capable of being enforced by some legal system? Maybe one of your officials could answer that. So, so you mean in terms of the precautionary measures that are being yes. discussed with the EU? So at, at present, as the Minister said, we don't have the full details of what's being proposed other than that the Commission we are having an open dialogue with them as they are with other member states and we are with France about what the first six months might look like. It's not clear yet whether they will be um, in their regulations because we haven't seen the full details of that yet. I mean, there are, compar there are comparable situations elsewhere in Europe where there are borders with other countries. So I would have imagined that the European Commission in that context, say with Switzerland or whatever, uh, would actually... Uh, have some kind of evidence as to the extent to which they need to have things tied down in black and white on the piece of paper so that the thing is done in an orderly manner. I think that's a perfectly reasonable 
reflection that you give and one that we can ponder as we take this forward. Okay. And there'll obviously be um, standard operating procedures around this that will need to be put in place and agreed. Um, but I certainly think as we have those conversations that we could most definitely give thought to the point that you raise. Can't commit to what the outcome would be, but I, but I recognise the observation. And just against that background, of course, if there are severe dis 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 disruption or delays, like, for example, the train I was on stopped at Coventry and everyone was told to get off, I mean, there are circumstances in which questions of compensation can arise, and no doubt that's another factor you have to take into account because where you've got a joint system for the European Commission on the one hand and our government and you as ministers operating this on the other, if things do go wrong and there is substantial uh, failure, then some people will be saying, you know, rather they, as they do with uh, cancellation of air flights and things like that, questions of compensation which could arise. I just put that on the table for you. I'm not asking for an immediate answer, but if you could just bear that in mind, I think that might be a good idea. Okay, so Greg Smith, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I want to talk about the app. It's come up a, a number of times. Now, Guy, you said you're expecting it in August. Can you clarify, first of all, what bit of it we are expecting? Because, of course, it's split in two with Frontex producing uh, the back end and then individual nation states taking the back end and either making it specific to them or themselves or their own needs. What bit of it are we expecting by August? Because previous evidence has suggested the back end should have actually been delivered in spring. wasn't and that nobody in the industry that's going to be affected by this is expecting the app to be in any way, shape or form ready to go and to actually be useful for the launch of EES. So my clear understanding is that the app will not be available at the point at which this, we anticipate, goes live in October. We would expect this to follow on accordingly. It is an area that we are consistently raising, both at official level and ministerial level, as something that we feel very strongly ought to be put in place at the first possible juncture. Because, as I said earlier, there are huge advantages around trying to be able to do as much of this processing upstream as possible. You're right to say, and my clear understanding is around the app, that there is a back-end part of the technology that will be made available to individual member states who would then have their own individual app-based process, which they themselves would be responsible for, but as part of the totality of delivery of EES as a scheme. So the only one we're particularly concerned about, given the, 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 the nature of Dover and so on, is the French version of the app. Can you update the committee, given the, the, the ministerial and official level dialogue that has been going on as to the speed with which the French are progressing their version of the app. Do you believe them to be giving it the priority that it should have in order to attempt to be ready uh, for at least, if not launch day, very soon after launch day? Or are other things going on and it doesn't seem to be making the progress you would expect an IT project to be making? It's difficult for me to comment authoritatively on the latter <laughs> because I'm not uh, familiar with all the intricacies of individual IT projects and most definitely not one that's not a HMG home office one. However, as I say, this does feature very routinely and very regularly in the engagement conversations that we have at all levels. We will continue to push on this. My understanding is that there is a recognition on the EU side and on individual member state side that this is something that will really help to mitigate some of these challenges. And again, there is a determination to try and deliver that app-based solution as quickly as possible. And it is most definitely something that I and Minister Opperman and others in government will continue to really press very hard on because the more of that upstream processing that can be done, the better it is. And the assessment on whether it's a priority for the French government to ensure that they're moving as fast as they can on this app. You know, other things are happening in France this year that they might be focused on. Is it a priority for the French Ministry of the Interior? 
there is, of course, understandably, and for good reasons, a big focus on the Olympics. But my understanding is, and you know, very happy for, for other colleagues to interject, that the French government recognises our interest in the app and effectively their interest in getting the app delivered as quickly as possible and the operators of the various juxtaposed ports also wanting to see the app in place. And so I do think it's accurate and fair to say that they are placing an emphasis on trying to progress that as quickly as possible to be able to introduce it into the EES process at the earliest possible date. I don't, I mean, I think clearly they have the Olympics as their primary concern in the very short form. I don't think it's fair to um, uh, underestimate how important this is to the French people as well, because it will be the French ports that will be struggling without such matters just as much. Um, and uh, I think they are very focused at uh, addressing this. I think, again, it is slightly chicken and egg, though, is that um, there is, until we know a bit more about what is proposed by the EU Commission, as I understand it, it's hard for them to design an app around that. Okay, fair enough. But given everything that we've said already, given all the evidence that we've taken as a committee on what could happen at certainly Dover on launch day, surely it is in the interests, you know, the same arguments that, that you just made on the, being in the French interest as well, not to have disasters and tailbacks and Kent being turned into a car park and, and all of the other things that, that could happen, to just delay the implementation until we know there is an IT solution and an app that's out there and working because that will prevent so much of the problem at port. So, do you want I, to take that first? I think what I would say is that as a UK government, you make quite a persuasive case. We, of course, would be very happy if the app were available on go live date we are working on the basis that it won't be available at the point at which this goes live if that implementation date is october but we've still got some way to go until we know definitively that that's the case but i don't think you'll hear this government or any government here in the united kingdom argue about the need for the app but also the fact that we would welcome the app being available at Go Live, but we just have to work on the basis that the app will not be available in the immediacy when this policy we anticipate goes live in October. And going to the EU and saying, well, let's agree it's in both of our interests not to go live in October if the technology isn't there to support it. Well, I think that there is a difference here with respect, which is, um, the implementation of EES and then the assistance in some respects of an app. It, it is not going to be a panacea to fix all problems uh, by way of having an app for all particular individuals and all particular vehicles. And I think the um, likelihood is after multiple delays that the 6th of October will proceed. I think then how that proceeds and what implementation looks like is very, very different. Hence why we have already secured a six-month soft launch. And the way that looks, fine details to be finally confirmed, does appear that we would be able to accommodate these changes in those circumstances. Now, clearly, Tom is totally right. We would prefer it. And it's not just us making this point, I trust me. There are plenty of other countries um, with significant ports who are equally uh, concerned and equally making said points to the EU Commission. Okay, thank you. Can I, can I just ask, if they've delayed it for seven years now already, and if it is clear that the app would help, why are the EU, or, or have we pressed the EU sufficiently to delay it to, in, in order to make sure that the, the passage is as smooth as possible. I mean, it, it just amuses me that there have been no rush for seven years, and yet now suddenly in a rush, even though the, all the technology is not in place. And are we making a, a, a case to them? Are we simply accepting that if the EU want it, then we have to do it? So I think it's clearly in everybody's interest to get the app-based solution available as quickly as possible. But these are matters that we continue to raise with them. And as I said right at the outset, 
there's kind of two strands to the engagement. Firstly, around go live in October, yes or no. And secondly, about if it is go live in October, yes or no, and we're still waiting definitive clarification around that, what can we reasonably do to make sure that this policy is able to be as successful as possible with the minimal disruption? But I do understand why after those periods of delay that you outline, they do want to get on and do this. Um, and I, for one, am certainly not going to criticise the EU for wanting to have that enhanced border security opportunity that this policy is seeking to help deliver, because it's entirely in line with the ambitions that we have for our own domestic border when it comes to the introduction, for example, of the ETA scheme that we're currently rolling out, which is certainly, when you take the package of EES and ETIAS together, not dissimilar, um, and which will have additional security benefits for us here in the United Kingdom. And that means, for example, that many individuals who come to this country presently um, without a visa, who we know very little about, in future, we will have considerably more information about those travellers, which we, means we can stop individuals who we wouldn't want to come to the UK from travelling in the first place, improving that screening, but also having that greater automation at the border, which is beneficial from a tourism perspective, but also from my perspective as the Border Force Minister, being able to focus Border Force teams on, on that higher risk activity. So I can understand why, after the delay, they want to get on and proceed, but that's not to say that we are not very focused in raising all of these points during the engagements that we have. I, don't want, I would be very wrong to presume by this committee that um, everybody from the PM to Foreign Secretary to Home Secretary aren't making these points very robustly. And it is not just our country making those points, others are making it to the EU Commission as well. So that uh, unquestionably those points are being made. Um, I think the flip side of that is, if one was to introduce this, the winter period is clearly the easier time to do as compared to Easter through summer. And secondly, if one introduces this with the degree of relaxations that is being talked about, then I think there is a great advantage of doing six months during the winter uh, where this matter can then people can come to terms with what the changes are and the work can be done. All right. So... Um Next question, David Jones, please. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, I'd like to ask a few questions uh, about process, uh, really. Um, which department has lead responsibility for this issue? Home Office. How long has that been the case? I have come into this role in um, December. At what point did we assume? About a year, I think. Yeah, I was going to say, it's, it's about this time last ago. year. Yeah. Um, as, as you've said, Mr. Perslove, um, this is, of course, an EU initiative. Um, the ES regulation was adopted in 2017, and it was always clear that the, uh, the initiative would apply to the United Kingdom. Um, it seems odd that the Home Office was not designated as lead department until 12 months ago. I can't give you a commentary as to why that was the case. I, as I say, came into this role in December, but I think it is fair to say that the government has been cited on this issue. I think it is fair to say that a lot of the detail has come forward in more recent times. And what I can speak to is that during my time in this role as Minister for Legal Migration and the Border, as Minister Opperman has said, um, in his respective ministerial portfolio, which is a busy one, this has been a very high priority. Oh, I, I appreciate for, for that. me, as the legal migration, this has been a very high priority. And I, and I think, you know, we are seeing very strong well, I, I, collaboration I, I, to, to make this work. I, I'm not in any sense pointing any fingers at the two gentlemen who are sitting in front of me at the moment, but this is an issue that has been uh, clearly uh, on the cards for some seven years. Uh, it was inevitable that problems would arise. Um, I find it odd that a, a lead department was not designated until some tw 12 months ago. Sorry, Mr Hobbs, do... So I, I was just going to draw a distinction between the cross-government effort that we have now, now that we have a very clear view to implementation, and the fact that the Home Office, in relation to the border, would have and was part of 
the negotiations when the UK was a member of the EU around this, and then through to monitoring that portfolio. So obviously we, all, we are the department that broadly leads on people and goods crossing the border, so that is well established. I think in terms of the cross-government effort and very much focus on this portfolio and its implementation, it's, it's probably fair to say that started a year ago once there was clearer view on the delivery. But that, the, the Home Office is, is generally in the lead, both operationally and policy, that notwithstanding that DFT, DEFRA and Cabinet Office have had various different interests in aspects of the border. Well, I, maybe, Mr Hobbs, you can help me with this one. I, I, I'd just like to have a flavour of what the government has been doing for the seven years uh, since EES became an adopted policy. So I, th I think we'll have to write to you on that. This is, I, as I say, I picked up this portfolio uh, specifically when I came into post in, in August. Uh, we would need to write to you to say exactly what we've been doing. But obviously, we have regular discussions with the French and with the Commission when we were part of the EU and, and since. But as I say, it's, it's about the last period when it's been greater clarity on its implementation where we've taken a a more structured approach across government on this particular part of the portfolio. I think it would be really helpful if you could let us have that note, please. Um, we've had complaints, as you know, from various witnesses. We've heard from travel operators uh, that the uh, EES project has been poorly managed. Um, they say they've had very little information from the EU and, or from the French. Um, what sort of efforts have been made uh, over the last seven years to get more information of this sort from the Commission and from the, uh, uh, the, the, the French? So, I, again, I can speak to the period with which I've been in post, and there has been very intensive discussion and collaboration and practical thinking about the steps that we can take in order to um, really make sure that we have all of the required infrastructure in place and that we are having the right conversations about precautionary measures. Um, it was good to be able to go along to see Eurostar. Minister Opperman has been engaging with various um, operators as well. There's consistent working at official level to understand the mechanics of their operations, what this set of proposals will mean for them. And we've been able to flex that work as and when we've had greater clarity around the parameters that we're working towards. As I've set out in answer to several points, there are still elements of this that are not definitively clear to us yet. And so that engagement will continue to be very important. Um, and I think when you look at the comms side, we are working to make sure that there is a proper um, approach to that that involves the operators, that involves us as the government, but again, recognising that we are not um, the sponsors of this scheme. This is an EU scheme, but we have a duty, we would argue, to make sure that travellers understand the change that's coming, what that means for them, what they need to do um, in practice. There has been really practical steps taken to work with operators to understand what we can do as part of the answer in terms of getting the infrastructure right on their sites. And for example, we at the Home Office have um, been supporting the purchasing of some additional kiosks to make sure um, that there are adequate numbers of kiosks available to try and smooth some of the flows of passengers um, passing through, as well as looking at other elements of the infrastructure that are required that, that Minister Opperman perhaps will give some additional um, detail around. So I would argue, in my experience of, of managing this from a ministerial perspective, mm -hmm. my understanding is that uh, originally this was a Cabinet Office lead, then passed the Home Office in January 2023. Um, but there has been very strong ministerial input. There has been very comprehensive engagement and collaborative working to find solutions with operators involving officials. And then both at official level, but also ministerial level, the international engagement, working with our counterparts in the EU countries and with the European Union, um, to make sure that we understand what their ambitions are, that we understand what the challenges are in their respective countries around implementation. So I think it's fair to say that certainly looking at that um, period whereby this has been under the stewardship of the Home Office, um, and certainly during the period with which I have been the minister, we have moved this forward very considerably 
But a lot of that has been as a result of simply being in receipt of additional detail that we weren't at earlier stages in receipt of that's meant that we can really kick on and bolster that planning. And I think, it, you know, again, I must stress that the criticism is not aimed at you in any way. It's clear from what you've just said that you are constantly waiting for more information from the European Union, having to press for that. Um, but it is very difficult for um, operators to operate in conditions where there's information still outstanding in respect of a scheme that is going to go live, it would appear, in as soon as October of the year. Except, I mean, it, except it, it's, it's completely unsatisfactory from their point of view. I, I accept that, that it is challenging. And you know, that is why we will continue to press through our engagement for the earliest possible visibility around dates, around precautionary measures, and any other associated requirements that we need to be working towards. But I don't know. Don't you think, I mean, it's really unacceptable that the European Union should effectively be keeping you in the dark, even at this late stage? Well, if I can help. So um, clearly, this was going to be introduced in 2022, and it didn't proceed. Then it was going to be introduced in 2023, and it didn't proceed. And the decision has been now made that it will start in October 2024. And we are working on the basis that it will proceed on that date. Now, there is time to go between then and that particular day. Clearly, we are working and in some respects, uh, there's a great line from Obama, which is don't waste a good crisis. And we are using the time to, as Tom has rightly outlined, improve tremendously what Home Office are doing but I look at Port of Dover, there is massive investment, tens of millions of pounds of investment in Port of Dover to upgrade and improve and enhance the facilities so they will be light years different to what someone has experienced even now or would experience a year or two ago. That is a, a good thing in the sense that they are genuinely improving and uh, expanding the port on a massive basis. So. I take the view that, you know, has this been, I think it originally was with Cabinet Office, partly because so many different agencies of government are involved, and that's the usual thing. With no criticism of Cabinet Office or previous, um, you know, Paymaster Generals who had control of this. That's the traditional thing when it's a multi-departmental matter, Cabinet Office run the show. I think subsequently a decision was made uh, that the Home Office should lead on it, and I think rightly so in the grand scheme of things because it ties into so much of what they're also doing. So I, I think until you know that this is definitely going to happen, it is hard to prepare. And we now know that it is likely to happen on the 6th of October. I genuinely think uh, government has really got behind this. Uh, there are a couple of points that are clearly, as we've discussed, we would like to be in a better position. But I do believe um, that we as a, a country and as our individual ports will be able to handle this particular situation, albeit there will be difficulties, um, in, on the 6th of October, given the uh, relaxations that have already been agreed uh, with the EU Commission. That is the key point. If it were a hard stop, start straight away 6th of October, then clearly that would make life much, much more complicated. Uh, I, I, let me stress again, I'm not criticising HMG. Uh, save to this extent. Um, you've been kept in the dark by the European Commission. I mean, they, they, they really appear to me to not, have not provided you with sufficient information. You're still coming before this committee and saying you're still uh, uh, awaiting information, which, as I say, I find extraordinary given the proximity of this start date. Um, who are you dealing with uh, in the European Commission? Which, which is your, what is your point of contact with them? So the Prime Minister has raised this with Ursula von der Leyen. I mean, on a more routine and, basis. And, and, I'll, and I'll perhaps let um, Mr Hobbs just touch on the official level engagement that, that goes on. Um, as has been said, this is being raised consistently by the PM, by the Foreign Secretary, by the Home Secretary, by the Secretary of State for Transport. But what is their excuse for keeping you in the dark? What, 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 what is their excuse? I mean, they, they, they've got an initiative coming through in a few months' time that potentially would cause chaos for travellers. And they're still keeping you in the dark. I mean, surely they must be giving you some excuse for behaving so inefficiently. Well, I would assume that um, they will want to take decisions about their state of readiness. 
Um, you say you we assume. have to. What do they tell you? Well, again, I'm not sure if there's any sort of official level um, additional commentary that, that can be made on this today. Um, but as I've said, we are working on the basis of this commencing in October. I don't think we have any choice but to work on the basis of this I, 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 in October. As you were that is the indicative position that no, we've been given. As you were told. No, no, but that's the indicative position. We must work towards that. The, the question is, that is still outstanding, as to whether they definitively, definitively, definitively decide to well, this is green light this for that date. We're talking about something that is due to possibly to take effect in a few months' time. And, you know, really one would have thought even given the tensions that have arisen as a consequence of Brexit, they would have got over that by now and internalised it and decided that they really do have to treat this country with respect as an important partner. But, but with respect, it is not a question of... Clearly, we are, up, we are very much on a cross-departmental, multi-minister basis from the PM downwards. We are standing up for the UK. No one disputes that. But it is not a question between the UK and the EU being treated differently. It really is not. It is. Are just generally inefficient? No. It is the question of all countries within the EU are facing issues in relation to the decision of the EU Commission. And it is the implementation of a EU Commission uh, decision to implement this on the 6th of October. I think, that with no disrespect, we will be able to deal with this and we have had the uh, negotiations and the agreements uh, given the nature of uh, the precautionary checks and the six-month period. Having an app, and anyone who's ever tried to uh, experience government apps over the last 14 years will know that they don't always work beautifully, having an app will potentially assist. And clearly, if this goes like a Swiss watch, forgive the pun, uh, with a benefit of uh, computer processing and an apps and things like that, then that would be a massive assistance. No one is disputing that. That will take time, and even if I had a, if I can put it this way, if as a minister I had the, was the worthy participant in an app right now on the 1st of May with the start date on the 6th of October, do I believe genuinely that would be utterly transformational and it couldn't possibly fail and there wouldn't be the problems that we've all experienced with all kinds of things ranging from stuff on your mobile phone to things that government produces up and down the, uh, the land, then clearly it would help, but it is not a panacea having that. I mean, the fact is it would be far easier for everybody uh, if this whole process were delayed until the app were ready and until proper procedural arrangements had been made. Um, it's going to cause you gentlemen considerable difficulty, I would imagine, if we go ahead on, in October, particularly if you don't get the information that you require. And um, I, I just feel that it's um, probably a good idea to protest as loudly as you possibly can to the European Union as to the fact that they're keeping you in the dark, that the timescale is challenging, and that there may well be problems for travellers from both the continent and from the United Kingdom. Point is well made, and I'm sure it has been noted both here and elsewhere. Thank you. Um, I just listening to the dialogue and the discussion, um, what does occur to me is it may to some of the people watching the pre this um, binge. Is it just possible that they don't really want to go fast enough because <coughs> they don't really mind very much? I mean, you keep on telling us that it's in their interest as much as it's in ours, but actually, I don't have any immediate knowledge of what the um, comparative economic advantage of people coming across that part of the water <coughs> to this country um, as compared to other, us travelling across to France, which is a massive... Uh, I mean, the travelling from the United Kingdom to France and Spain and the rest of the continent is pretty massive with the number of people who travel. I know they go by plane a lot, but then also there is this um, travelling by sea and by um, <coughs> Eurostar and so forth. So what I'm just troubled by, but it may be just that I'm slightly cynical about attitudes that one gets from some of the 
European Commission over the years. I've been in this committee since 1985, and sometimes I've been <coughs> frustrated by their attitudes. So, um, is that just dispel for me, if you can, uh, a sense that I'm concerned listening to what you're saying, that very interesting questions are being put by my colleagues, but I'm still left wondering what it is that's holding the European Commission and the European Union up. Uh, is it lack of interest or is it lack of um, uh, competence or, or is it just that they don't really care? So, of course, from a UK standpoint, this is most relevant because of the fact that we have the juxtaposed controls, which are hugely beneficial. And it is right that we continue to have um, those juxtaposed controls in place, not least because they are critical in our um, defences against illegal migration into this country. Um, and we've made enormous strides forward in recent years in that regard, and the juxtaposed controls have undoubtedly played an important part of that. And that's why the challenge manifests on this side of the channel when it comes to the operators that, that we're talking about today. But there's also, for travellers outbound, for example, from the United Kingdom into the EU, a need for them to be complying with these processes on the EU side. So there is a huge swathe of different um, ports that are affected by this in all of the different member states um, that they need to um, have assurance around, no doubt, in order to be able to go live with this policy and to be satisfied that it can be delivered safely and properly um, with minimal disruption in each of those member states and in each of those um, port environments. So it is a significant operation. I'm also very conscious and seized of the fact that there are huge economic factors associated with outbound tourism from the United Kingdom into the European Union, particularly um, into France. And I think that you know when you consider that aspect of this, there is no advantage to the EU or to individual member states um, for being particularly obstructive around this or for this not being a success. But again, I would go back to, and I've had this conversation now on numerous occasions with um, representatives of individual member states, that the security benefits of delivering this change are profound and that that is front and centre in their determination to deliver on this policy. And bearing in mind that I am introducing the ETA scheme as the UK Government Minister, which has many similarities, it would be wrong of me to in any way realistically be critical of that principle because all of us want to ensure the security of our borders and to keep our respective populations safe. I think we're doing a good job when it comes to the delivery of ETA. I think the fact we've gone for a phased rollout of that programme is also beneficial. We've had a test and learn approach to this. Um, we're able to iterate it. We're delivering it successfully. The early feedback has been good. I think there's a lot of lessons that can be learned from how we've delivered that. And actually, there is very much a willingness for my team here in the UK to be able to engage um, with their EU counterparts to talk about the way in which we've gone about that work and, and any respective lessons that they can learn. But first and foremost, I know and believe that the primary consideration driving this is the security advantages of delivering these schemes in the same way that domestically the changes that I'm introducing through ETA and eVisa and the like are also about trying to improve the security of our borders and keep people in our in our respective countries safe. Well, I was going to ask Mr Jones, because he has another question that's coming up a bit later. I just wonder whether you might like to ask question 12. At the well, yeah, yes, it's a useful point to ask it, because you raise the uh, issue of juxtaposed controls. Um, a lot of the practical difficulty that we will have as a consequence of the introduction uh, of uh, EES uh, is a consequence, really, of the, f of the fact that we do have juxtaposed controls, because uh, in, in uh, Dover, which we visited, we, we saw how constrained um, the, 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 the land is and how difficult it will be to, to create these. Similarly, in St Pancras, it's a relatively small um, area where they're trying to shoehorn um, several kiosks in at the moment. Um, one of the issues that's been raised, as you probably know, given that you've read the evidence, is that it would be less of a problem if registration could be uh, 
performed away from the juxtaposed controls. You mentioned the app, but is it not possible, for example, for the kiosks that, that we, we've been discussing to be put in some central location, uh, say in London or in some of the major cities, so that people can pre-register? Why does it have to be delivered at the, uh, at the time and point of travel? Shall I go first and I'll let Tom come in? So if I can, um, he can deal with the sort of broad principles. Can I discuss Dover? Because I think it's a, it's a really key point. Because obviously of all the juxtaposed um, locations, that's the one, as you rightly say, which is so constrained by geography. Um, I think two points to make. The first is they have gone to a great effort and are investing already to do three particular developments. Right. On the first case, that coaches will be now be dealt with at the old boatyard in what's called the Western Docks. So they have developed an area where coaches will be done separately in a different location. So they are creating extra space to deal with that. Um, as you know, they have talked about filling in what is called the Granville Dock for many, many years. They will have shown you that when you went uh, to uh, Dover to have a look at it. That is being filled in. That will be operational by next year. Um, that, again, is a massive investment. And then on the eastern docks, which is where cars primarily are dealt with at the present stage, um, they are clearly introducing all the kiosks, creating extra lanes, because by taking the coaches out of this, that makes it easier. But what is called the outbound, uh, outbound border control project uh, will be tens of millions of pounds of investment that they will be making, which, uh, and, and I, I'll quote the, um, the chief executive who said, this will be transformational answer to many of the issues that held, have held Dover back over the years. My point being is that this investment is to address this problem, but it is also to address problems that have existed for some time, given the geography is so tight uh, at Port of Dover. So there is three different types of investment which will enhance and improve the location. Now, in terms of pre-registration and the like, uh, clearly when one has an app, there, there will be the potential improvement of that. On coaches, for example, we have uh, made massive strides. So we have totally changed the way in which coaches are being dealt with after an extensive negotiation. So it's been dealt with away from uh, the eastern docks, which is where it's traditionally dealt with, some considerable distance away. The vehicle is then sealed. It then drives to the eastern docks to get on the ferry. Uh, the seal is checked and it gets on the ferry. That is an example of it being dealt with. It's all bit in Dover, but it is outside the, the real pinch point, which is the Eastern Docks. Now, is there scope to do more in the future of that sort of thing? Well, before you go on, could, could I just get back to the point about the app? Yep. The app will not actually uh, deliver all the information that is required. You, you still need to produce fingerprints, as I understand it. So... Um, how, how will that be dealt with? The, the, the app is a partial solution. It produces part of the information that's required, but there is still more information that is required in order to complete the process. Right. How will that be dealt with? Well, um, I think the, the practical reality is that the fingerprint will still need to be provided. Yes. That, that is not something that can be pre-registered by way of an app. No. So it, 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 there will still be delay while, that, while the fingerprints are actually being delivered? Uh, well, if, if, if it is the case, um, I'm going to try and push back because clearly we're introducing an extra burden, okay? One accepts that. But that's one of the reasons why Dover are hiring so many extra people, why they're creating extra capacity, why they're taking larger kiosks, why they're taking certain key people out of the game so that they can focus on the pinch points. So there is going to be more burdens than there are presently there because you're taking a fingerprint and you don't take it at the present stage. Yes. Are they doing things to address that so they've got more people and they're trying to divert people away from the pinch points? Yes, they are. Can I get back to the, the, the question I raised? Um, why does this have to be done <coughs> at the time and the point of travel? So I've leafed through my pack and come up with the very specific wording that we are working from and the conditions are essentially that this must be completed under the supervision of an EU border guard and that this should take place in the vicinity of the point of embarkation. 
So you will appreciate that that is quite a prescriptive position yes. that invariably prevents you from adopting that sort of solution. Uh, but yes, but, but, but that is, uh, that, that is a, a policy that has been arrived at by the European Union. That's the regulation. But, but that yes. is not to say that these are not conversations that we can continue to have <clears throat> in the course of our engagement if there is a willingness to look at practical application of this. But there is that challenge that that is baked into the regulation that we are working to My in terms of the delivery of the scheme. evidence that we've had is that the European Union refuses to allow registration away from the point of travel and the time of travel. Well, that, so well, that was the case. That, that, yeah, that described, but but, but... but, but, I mean, it seems odd and perverse that they should do when well, let, let me less disruption if it could be done elsewhere. So the evidence you had effectively, taking Dover as an example, required everything to take place at the Eastern Dock, right? Um, they have moved on that, so, and they've moved very significantly, so we have now got an agreement that um, we can deal with coaches at the very least at the Western Dock, which takes in, completely transforms the, the physical landscape. It takes a lot of um, uh, the, 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 the physicality of other things out of the game. Um, now, ongoing discussions and negotiations are being had as to whether cars could be dealt with in another way in another location. Now, that is a step forward that they, by way of negotiation by Home Office and various other departments, is a very positive inclination. And they've worked on the basis, bluntly, that as it's all within the confines of Port of Dover and we found a solution to seal that vehicle after it's been mm. checked, that you can then proceed on that basis. Um, I think it's a it's a quite a big stretch to say I can register in London mm -hmm. and then get on a uh, a ferry to leave and to go into France. And as I understand it, um, production of this or of these biometric details w w will actually then last for several years. I think it's mm -hmm. three years, isn't it? Yes. So uh, sub subsequent journeys will not be subject to these problems. If if in fact it will last for for a three year period. Why is it not possible to register in some other location? I mean, I appreciate, again, it's not your policy, but as I understand it, the European Union are insisting that the delivery of the biometric details uh, is supervised by um, a, a, a Frontex or, or, or Border Force official. I can't understand why you couldn't arrange for facilities to be provided remotely with European Frontex or Border Force officials supervising the delivery of the biometric details sometime before the date of travel. Why has it all got to be done at the point and date of travel? It, it, I appreciate, again, it's not your policy, but what, what reason have you been given for this? My understanding is that these are the sorts of points that have been raised during previous engagements. And, and what is their response? Well, I mean, they would, they would lead in by saying, this is what the regulation says, and as a consequence, this is what we need well, to, that's a bit like to deliver. There's no, isn't it? I mean, if they're not, if they're not prepared to reconsider the policy... I know, but I, but, I wouldn't want, but I wouldn't want the committee to think. I really wouldn't want the committee, and I do think this is important. I would not want the committee to think that we haven't seen quite a level of practical sensible deliberation that has led to getting into a better place when it comes to delivering on this policy. So as has been touched on in various answers, we have seen, for example, the response on coaches and the posture in relation to coaches shift and change to get a better answer in place to coach travel at Dover and how that's handled. So there is a level of prescription associated with this by the nature of the regulation and what the regulation requires. I understand that conversations have been had looking at a whole host of different possibilities previously. Inevitably, this is one that has been discounted as a consequence of the fact that the regulation says a certain thing and they feel very strongly, and I can understand that's what the regulation says, that's what they want to see delivered that that has been discounted. That is not to say that these aren't the sorts of things that we can revisit during the engagement that we have. But I wouldn't want the committee to think that every request we make is met with an, an indifference or an unwillingness to, to engage around it and to see some movement, because that's demonstrably not the case. You said earlier that juxtaposed controls were, I think, as you put it, hugely beneficial. 
Uh, you said that they were important from the point of view of security. They're also, in the context of this development, uh, EES, possibly causing more problems than they're solving. Are you reconsidering whether juxtaposed controls should continue to be maintained? Or, put another way, if chaos is caused as a result of this policy, will you reconsider whether just a juxtaposed controls are, are, are still beneficial to the extent that they uh, outweigh the inconvenience that may be caused by, by, by EAS? Well, as you would expect, we keep all aspects of our migration and borders system under careful and close review. But there are certainly no uh, intentions on the UK government side to move away from the juxtaposed controls model. They, as I said, have a very important role to play when it comes to preventing clandestine entry into the United Kingdom, but also, and I'm sure DFT colleagues would speak to this more eloquently than I can, but they're also integral to managing traffic flows at the Port of Dover in particular, um, and obviously that sort of roll-off, uh, roll-on, roll-off um, approach to that, and just making sure that in the vicinity of Dover... will, however, keep that policy under review bearing in mind that chaos may well be caused by the implementation well, of any, any government must always keep all policies under review, and that migration and borders is no different. Here. There's most definitely no um, expectation or anticipation at this point that we would not continue with the juxtaposed ports arrangement. All right, thank you. Yes, thank you. Is that enough, David? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, on the question of attitudes of British adult travellers, um, who have been asked by which co-op insurance, I think. Have you come across this survey? Not as yet, but I, as yet. I will be reading this later. You will. Um, according to research by co-op insurance, um, it seems to have shown that over 60% of adult British travellers do not know that EES will be introduced shortly. But it also appears that where they were asked what they would think if they were to be subjected to EES, that you get rather an alarming answer, which is that they would not want to travel to Europe if they did have to be subjected to the system. Now, I'd be grateful if you could look at this later, because I don't think it's fair to ask you this question on the basis of something you haven't come across before. Could you have a look into this? Because... Um, it also raises the question of the awareness campaign that you're going to have to introduce, but also, of course, the imponderables that we're currently faced with, which you've quite openly and honestly accepted, and also the attitude of the authorities in the European Union and, and, and so forth. So I'm going to just simply leave it at that and say, would you be good enough to look at this survey? Because um, I don't want in any way to... To, to sort of make it look as if um, we're making a judgment about this at this stage. But if it were to turn out that if people were aware of the fact that this was coming in and they then said, well, in that case, we don't want to travel to Europe, it might reinforce the attitude of those in the European Union and the Commission who would say, well, if that's the attitude that people genuinely have at this point in time, then we want to get on with doing this as quickly as possible with all the appropriate apps and the rest of it, because otherwise there may well be some drying up of travel to other parts of Europe through the channel routes. So can I just sort of put that to you as something that you might think about and then come back to us when you've had a chance to look at it and respond accordingly then rather than now? Uh, happy to go away, consider it and give you an answer in writing. Uh, the only point I would make is twofold. The first is considerable thought is going across government on a communications campaign um, and there are various phases of that and there are various decisions being made on a uh, cross-departmental basis and we are engaging with the ferry operators and all the other operators on an ongoing basis. Yeah. Um, the, clearly any change of any nature is, uh, is new to people and uh, but there are as Tom has rightly outlined many very, very good reasons why greater border security is something that should be lauded and supported uh, with the burdens that go with that. And frankly, in a very complex and difficult world, 
making our borders more secure uh, is also something that uh, needs to be done. OK, well, I've put that on the table. Um, and now, very patiently, the chairman of the Transport Select Committee has been sitting almost next to me, uh, waiting to ask a question he would like to ask. But I have to say that he also, no doubt, is taking on board the exchanges uh, and he may wish to carry this forward in his own committee because it's obviously a matter of some importance to all of us. So, Ian, would you like to ask the next question? Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to turn to the, uh, the costs of installing uh, the infrastructure uh, that you've both referred to, uh, both as a capital cost, but also the ongoing uh, current costs for maintenance, for additional staff costs and the like. Uh, Minister Perskov, in correspondence you've said that you're arranging financial support for uh, the places that have juxtaposed controls. Uh, can you update us on what funding is being provided, both say on the capital side and ongoing uh, resource costs? So I will let um, Minister Opperman deal with this predominantly on the basis that obviously the DFT is responsible and has the kind of lead relationships with the respective um, ports and their operators um, and has been very involved on a project specific level. But as I said earlier, for example, the Home Office has been providing some additional funding in order to increase the availability of kiosks to lift the level of kiosks that are available to individual um, operators. And in the spirit of wanting to make this work and recognising that by coming together and playing our part as part of a coordinated approach as the UK government with individual port operators and trying to move forward in a spirit of pragmatism with our EU friends, um, we have wanted to make some investment to try and support that. As I say, we have specifically um, stood behind that as the Home Office, but there's other projects that I think Minister Oppenheim would want to sure. outline. Shall I? I'll, I'll I'll couch it in suitably uh, politician terms by saying that as not I can't because not everything is finally confirmed and some bits are an ongoing negotiation with individual uh, organisations that I can't give you the precise figures and the precise uh, items because this is still ongoing. All right. However, there is certain bits I can talk about and I'll try and give you as much detail as I can. Clearly. A bid was put in by Port of Dover for a levelling up bid for £45 million, which was granted and was granted last year, as I understand it. Um, it has gone through and is going through a, a Competition and Markets Authority review, um, because obviously that is government funding to an, uh, a, a juxtaposed ports. That review is ongoing. We hope to have a result of that very, very shortly. The large amount of that money will go to dealing with the very substantial investment in the eastern docks at Port of Dover, which will constitute the majority of the outbound uh, border control project. Separate to that, there is investment going into the Granville Docks project, which will be up and live and finished uh, next year. Uh, I have learnt far too much about how to fill in a dock, settle it, the time there is to uh, allocate for sand to settle and uh, various other things. That takes longer than you or I would like it to be, but it is being done and it will be done next year. Uh, separate to that, there is money that is being uh, provided by DFT uh, to the organisations of all three of the juxtaposed uh, destinations. And Home Office, I know, are giving some money as well. Uh, that's in the millions of pounds. Um, the precise figures I can't say today. Uh, but I don't think there is any doubt whatsoever that between the levelling up bid of 45 million, uh, multiple millions by uh, Home Office and by the DFT, uh, particularly the DFT, I should say, and separately, massive investment, to be fair, by Eurotunnel. They will tell you, and I think it's a publicly... Um, information available, they will tell you they have invested millions to make Eurotunnel ready for all of this, uh, and Port of Dover are putting in their money in a very substantial way as well. And so I believe there is huge government support, and we are assisting in every other way as well, but hard cash is definitely being uh, provided. Um, I, I keep coming back to the point, though, that clearly this is, and all of us in this room accept this, 
this is a change and it will be a potential burden and how we handle it is clearly important and matters to everybody. But because of this, there is massive investment going into our ports. Some would argue, with the benefit of hindsight, some of this investment should be made 5, 10, 15 years ago. But I look at Dover as it is now, and Dover as it will be in two to three years' time. It will be totally transformed, totally transformed. And what you visited when you did your site visit and what you visit in the future will be totally different. And it's addressing not just the problems that we're dealing with now and the complications and how we handle it, but it's also addressing a large number of other things that have frankly have been uh, bedeviling uh, Dover, as we all know, for some period of time. Thank you. You've both been at pains to emphasise this afternoon that this is an EU project. Are they making any contribution to the cost that Dover, St Pancras, your tunnel are incurring? Uh, and if they're not, should they be? Certainly when it comes to some of the kit that is relevant to this, they have been providing a sort of minimum level of offer that they provide to operators. Um, if I can add a bit, so um, I think you know, Tom is right in the sense that they have made some assistance and some provision of information and they're sharing a variety of things. But in terms of the degree to which the UK government is giving contributions and support, it's not comparable by any stretch. The only point I would make is that individual EU countries, so, you know, the Port of Holland, Antwerp, Cherbourg, they're having to make investments as well. This is not the situation that, as I was trying to stress earlier, this isn't the situation that just the UK is investing in their ports to upgrade them and improve them. Other countries are doing this just as much. And because we are all taking this very seriously on both this particular point, but also on a border security point. So someone's going to have to pick up the bill for this. Is it going to be the traveller via higher fares? Well, I think if I deal with Port of Dover, they would say that first and foremost, the investment in the port is no different to what the investment that any railway operator, airport operator, um, port operator does to upgrade and improve their facility, whether that is I don't know, Heathrow Terminal 4, 5, whatever, or an enhanced station capacity. Um, that is some things that they've invested to make their facility better. Um, You'll have to, I can't answer for the individual uh, organisations as to whether they're going to put fares up and the like, uh, of the like, but that's obviously a matter for them. Uh, but I think they would also deter be determined by things like throughput, volume, uh, numbers of people, uh, how this uh, beds in, and the degree to which uh, custom continues on the present levels. Thank you. I'd like now to turn to the another potential cost, and that is traffic disruption uh, through Kent. Uh, we've heard evidence that, of course, Dover has had problems uh, on occasions in the past, and that has quite a significant deterrent effect for other traffic visiting Kent towns uh, and the span that they will make. Are you... What, what assessments have you made of the potential disruption? If this doesn't work, there are problems uh, on the wider camp traffic situation. There is a, I mean, there's a number of different questions in that, if I can address them. So, obviously, on the call I had and the meeting I had yesterday uh, with all the ports, with the port and also the ferry operators, the Kent County Council and, and representatives of the Kent Resilience Forum were there. Um, we have met with them on a repeat basis. Officials meet with them virtually weekly. Um, there is huge amounts of effort being made to support Kent as a whole. Uh, obviously, both Tom and I have engaged with local MPs on a repeat basis to make sure their voices are heard and that the representatives of individual towns who are concerned about any disruption are heard. Um, there is some degree of support going to uh, Kent uh, County Council. Uh, I can't be precise as to the sums. Officials may know the exact sums and whether we are able to disclose those at, particular, at this particular stage. But we are very, very keen 
uh, to see a lessening on a long-term basis of things like Brock and TAP. Uh, it is clearly the case um, that that causes disruption. I'm acutely aware that that um, affects communities further up the line from Ashford to Faversham and beyond, and that is something that we are very, very conscious. Now, to an extent, I take Port of Dover as an example, the massive investment that they are making to create massive extra capacity will make a huge difference in that respect. The fact that coaches now can be dealt with at the Western Docks is game-changing, in my opinion. But um, clearly, the devil will be in the detail, and we are very keen to make sure this runs smoothly. The estimation by Port of Dover is that with the uh, soft launch and the uh, precautionary measures, is that they will be able to handle the volumes that they're dealing with. But what's the contingency plan if it doesn't, both on a short-term basis? You've got uh, TAP and, and Brock to deal with sort of at the moment. But if it becomes clear when the system starts that you're having regular long delays in traffic approaching the port, are you contingency planning for that? So the answer is yes. But I think, can I just go back to the regular long delays? I think we, we need to understand, and obviously the final precision is not there, but what is proposed under the precautionary flexibility measures is that there will be a, effectively, the, the, there will be a massive reduction in the checks that are presently being proposed, which obviously will alleviate the burden of the queuing and any particular problems, forgive me. Um, now, um, that's the most important thing. In other words, if you've got a a pressure valve that you can apply um, that will stop this particular situation escalating, that is the game changer. Now, clearly the first six months are also the quieter months that we are dealing with in terms of Port of Dover. There are certain key times for every half term, for example, is always a, is, is a tricky time. But uh, obviously we wish to make sure that this is, uh, we utilize the soft launch, We we prepare in the way, the best possible way, as all the government departments do, and then we're in a position that uh, we have this tried and tested and know where we are. There are a variety of other improvements. National highways are improving certain bits of the highway. Work is being done with uh, a variety of different agencies on an ongoing basis, and clearly contingency plans are in place, as there already are, with respect for, you know, we are aware, for example, I think it was Easter last year, there was a particular um, complications where you know there were very considerable delays. Uh, that hasn't effectively happened much since. We're very much keen that it doesn't happen again. Thank you. Have, no, no, okay. no. I, I, have you got another question? No, no, I, I can stop there. Are you sure? Yeah. I, I just mentioned this because um, this is a complex question, and we are extremely grateful to you for coming and for helping to elucidate much of, much of these questions. Um, the, 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 there are other issues that we will want to raise with you in correspondence and it's even possible that we may ask you to come back again because there are some uncertainties that may need to be resolved in the next few weeks if we can manage to get you back again for another session but I'm not committing you to that right now. I, there is one question which we do want to get out into the open right now and that is this one which is regarding the entry exit system and when it goes live and freight being caught in traffic around Kent. Are you worried that perishable goods are going to get stuck at the UK border and consequently is there going to be a shortage of food on UK supermarket shelves? That's the question. Um. Uh, do you want to take that? Or I, 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 I think I would actually refer to what you've just said, actually. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you've talked about in, in response can, to can, Mr. Stewart, haven't yeah, you, yeah, where yeah. you think things will be so in the autumn. The goods, and I know, think that that would guard against those there risks. Are, there are a couple of things. So um, TAP and Brock already exist. And there is already uh, those mechanisms in place for dealing with uh, potential difficulties and disasters. When, for example, there is a tremendous traffic accident is a good example. You know, if there is a serious traffic accident and you can't get through uh, the motorway system, or when there is a potentially a strike has happened in the past, then these things do occur. 
But by and large, we believe that Port of Dover will be able to accommodate this, given what uh, we've managed to secure by way of the ameliorations at the Western Docks, given what we've managed to secure in terms of uh, the uh, precautionary flexible, flexible measures. Okay. And <coughs> the, last, the very last question is basically um, the issue of whether or not we're going to end up with um, a further issue, uh, which is, uh, are there going to be difficulties in terms of, for example, having wilting lettuces lying around in dock areas which simply because they are perishable are going to be put at risk. I mean, is that a serious problem? Are you taking those practical down-to-earth issues into account? Well, I think, uh, let's start with the suppliers themselves. The suppliers themselves are keen that their produce gets to our supermarkets and to our shops, and they are the ones who are, they, they start with their best approach. Clearly, the ferry operators and the ports are keen to facilitate the movement of those goods. Um, in terms of uh, the capability of transferring uh, produce through the winter months with the precautionary flexibility measures we have, we have managed to agree, we believe that that will be capable of handling those particular problems. Yeah. Obviously, if there was to be a particular, uh, it applies already, if there is a road traffic accident and the whole system grinds to a halt, or if there is, you know, uh, an example is if there is terrible weather and the ferries cannot sail, then clearly I, as a supplier of fresh produce, am going to struggle because I'm stuck at Calais and I can't get onto a ferry. They, they, they are already have these issues and they already have a capability of dealing with this. Bear in mind most of these um, particular vehicles have, uh, where they're carrying such produce, have uh, refrigerated lorries. I mean, what this really boils down to is that there are a significant number of complications of a practical nature. You come here and you've given us a number of answers to some of the things that were really worrying the committee very much. You've given us some reassurances, but with a caveat that there is yet more work to be done and you still have to resolve certain negotiating questions with the European Union and uh, with the um, uh, European Commission. So I think the best thing for us to do at the moment, because we've got a limited amount of time, and just simply come back to us possibly later, but in the meantime we'll drop you a line asking you certain questions which we believe we will be able to resolve by writing, and then you can respond to it. So I'm going to bring the session and to please, an end now. Before you do, there's one, there's one question which I think some people listening to this today will be concerned about. And that is that we have concentrated on what happens within the United Kingdom. There will be many people who will arrive, and they'll arrive en masse at airports um, throughout the European Union for their holidays. Um, what preparations do you or have you discussed with the EU as to how they're going to deal with the number of people who arrive at Malaga, uh, Ibiza, uh, a number of other places where, where Aeroplanes all come in at once, there's huge queues, and you've described the process by which they're going to have to register. Um, how are you sure we're not going to have huge queues um, for holiday makers who, for the first time, are entering Europe under this new system? Very good point. So I think, do you want to, no, you go. No, so, I mean, this is something that we are very mindful of, and there are conversations ongoing about what we can do to try and align our communication strategy around this as much as possible. I would again just reiterate the point that this is an EU scheme and obviously they are responsibility, they are responsible and hold responsibility within their jurisdiction for um, the various ports that those travellers <coughs> are going into. They will need to deliver this practically on the ground and make arrangements that will accommodate those travellers. But we want to play our part, particularly in ensuring that everybody understands clearly what it is that they will be required to do, what this change means, not just for those travelling from the um, juxtaposed control ports, but also for those arriving into the European Union. And one of the things that I've been at real pains with officials to emphasise has been that I, A, want to have that alignment of communications with 
the communications that the EU is making around tourists, but also ensuring that we give as early a visibility to travellers as is possible, working with operators to make sure that there are consistent, good quality messages being conveyed when people are making bookings, when people are having tickets coming through, when people are getting reminders, so that everybody's clear-sighted about what this change means for them. But obviously, it's a matter for the individual ports within those EU countries to have the arrangements in place to ensure that there aren't unnecessary and needless queues. But again, in a way that we've been talking about in terms of precautionary measures and their delivery at the juxtaposed ports here in the UK, that would also be applicable in those ports in the event that at an EU destination within an EU member state, if there were queues, certainly within those first six months where there's an express agreement to those uh, mitigations being available, that they would invoke that to ensure that there isn't disruption that um, people would think was... I, I uh, think I've got to bring it to an end now. I see that yeah. Mr Offerman uh, would just like to make... Sure, very, very briefly on the really airport's good. point that Mr Wilson raised, I mean, I think the individual airports are addressing this themselves mm -hmm. and they have got to prepare for this and also they are looking for the ameliorations and the precautionary measures uh, as others are doing because they don't want to have people uh, backed up in the, in the way that you outlined. Obviously, if you require us to return, we will return uh, probably slightly greyer and slightly... Uh, yes. uh, That's all part of the system. It almost definitely is, sir. OK, well, thank you very much. It's been very helpful. You added some new light, but there is more light to come. So I shall draw the meeting to a close at that point. Thank you very much indeed. The proceeding has ended. 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 The proceeding has ended.